I always thought that I was an ordinary person until I went my first time to Africa. Actually, I went to a rural village in the north of Namibia, and I went to a community which, does, which does, just had one single toilet for the whole community. Just imagine this. You're living in a village, and you just have one single toilet. That toilet was actually not a real toilet. It was more like a hole in the ground, like you have in Norway, the so-called Uttedu. There was no running water or anything, and that toilet was so narrow that you actually had to enter it backwards. You couldn't turn. And you had, I figured out after some time that the best way of using that toilet was to have this kind of skiing position to keep your balance, because, of course, you didn't want to sit on that toilet because all those people were using that toilet. So, but that talk will not be about toilets. Uh, <laughs> the point I want to make is um, I realized that I actually have a quite extraordinary life by having my own toilet at home. And it's not only about toilets, it's about so much more. Think about what we have here. We have running water. We can just turn on the tap and there's water coming out. We do not have to fetch water. We do not have to walk kilometers for fetching water. It's the same with food. I can just go to the supermarket and I can just buy food. I can buy as much food as I want. I can eat whatever I want. So being back in Europe after this kind of cultural shock trip to Namibia, I realized that, wow, I actually have so much, and there are so many other people in the world who do not have that. And I had a feeling of starting to appreciate my life, but not only that, I started feeling responsible. I was thinking, no, why is it like this? We need to do something to change that. And I wanted to give something back to those communities. So I started thinking, what would be the best way of giving something back to those communities? And I decided to study development studies, because then I thought my profession would be about that, and I could do it as my job to help other people. And while studying development studies, I was thinking, well, what could I do? What could be the best way of helping people? What could be the kind of silver bullet to find, or the kind of holy grail for development? So I actually came to solar cooking, and I realized that, wow, solar cooking is actually quite a great idea. And I will tell you in some minutes why. Um, the picture I have here is from India I took during my field work. And that's the solar cooker, which you can see here as well, the called SK14. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about solar cooking. So solar cooking works like this, that actually solar rays are converted into heat energy. And this is retained by a cooking pot. And then you can just use the heat energy for cooking. And solar cookers, they are really not a new idea. There have been so many types of solar cookers around the world. And... There is the solar cooking network on the internet, which estimates that solar cooking projects are taking place in 114 countries around the world. And there are 510 NGOs involved in solar cooking. And now you probably wonder, okay, but what is so great about solar cooking? So why is she talking all the time about solar cooking? So as I said, I was really fascinated by solar cooking. Because first of all, one thing um, is that it reduces deforestation. What you have to know is that in those countries where people do not use solar cookers, they use firewood mainly for cooking. And due to population growth, uh, the amount of firewood uh, use increases. And this is a picture I took during my field work in Mozambique. And my friends in the car, they told me that, you know, Pierre, for many years ago, that area was a dense forest. But now there's nothing anymore because people go and collect more and more firewood. So by having a, a solar cooker, you do not have to go out anymore and collect firewood. But there's more than that. Uh, this is another picture uh, I took in Mozambique. And that was actually on the way. Um, we were just driving for the weekend trip. And I saw those two women on the road. And I said to my research assistant, please, can we stop here? I really would like to talk to those women. Because it's actually women and young children in those countries mainly who carry firewood. And they walk longer and longer distances because of this population growth and the higher demand to carry firewood. So we stopped those women, and we asked them, we w I wanted to know, okay, when did you start working, and how often do you go, and how long do you take? And they actually told me that they started walking already in the early morning hours, and they walk all the day until the evening, and that like three, four times a week. So, and you can see on the, on the picture already that their heads are a bit bended because of all the weight they have. So to give you some statistics also, uh, it's estimated that for 2.5 billion people, biomass accounts for 90% of household energy consumption. Imagine this, 2.5 billion people. If we could get these 2.5 billion people using solar cookers, 
what that would mean. But I want to give you a better impression of what this actually means to carry firewood. I wanted to get a feeling for that, so I tried it myself in Mozambique. So we visited um, some relatives of my research assistant, and I saw a little bit firewood lying around, and I said, hey, can we just put this like a bundle or something, and can I try to carry that? And they were looking at me, what? You want to carry firewood? Why do you want to carry firewood? I would like to know how it is. So we have tried it. Um, they have tried it to put it on my head. And as you can see, they had a lot of fun with that. I was actually not really good, because I'm supposed to carry the firewood without holding my hands up, but I couldn't manage. I didn't have any balance. But I already faced a lot of problems with this small amount of firewood, and that was almost nothing, and I could feel really a lot of weight on my head. So by using a solar cooker, you do not have to carry firewood anymore. But there is even more than this. Another thing is the smoke production related to firewood. Because people who make use of firewood normally cook on open fires, and they use the so-called three stone fires, where you put three stones, then the firewood, and you burn the firewood. Uh, that's the picture I took during my field work in India, and that's outside. And you can see already the high level of smoke production. So imagine that indoor. So actually, the World Health Organization estimates that more people are dying because of indoor air pollution than of malaria. So indoor air pollution is the kind of silent killer. And by using a solar cooker, you can avoid all those kind of things. Um, but then actually, so after I heard about all those benefits, and I thought that solar cooking is really great, uh, I went to the field, and I wanted to find out, OK, how is it actually in the field? And I realized all these kind of expectations and benefits I had in my mind, they were not there. The situation was quite different. And there were other things which mattered for the locals. And I want to share three stories tonight with you from my fieldwork, which make you a little bit rethinking of solar cooking. The first one is from Burkina Faso. I went last year to Burkina Faso to compare some solar cooking systems. And among others, I visited a solar bakery, so where you use solar energy for baking bread. When I arrived at that place, I saw that the solar bakery was not in use, and I wondered why. So I asked the bakers. I said, hey, you're having this solar bakery here. Why are you not using it? You know, we bake bread, and we normally bake bread. We start working at 10 p.m., and we are finished at 7 a.m., so people have fresh bread in the morning to have breakfast, and there is no sun. Quite obvious, right? But it seemed like that no one really talked to those bakers before. So there is a problem with the end user needs. We are not looking at the end user needs. We come up with great technologies, but we forget about the end users, and they are not involved in that process. Uh, another story I want to tell you from India. Uh, India is actually regarded to be the solar country. It has a long solar tradition, and there has been a lot on solar cooking as well. Uh, I went to India in 2011, and I figured out that there are actually quite many religious institutions using solar cookers. And I got that idea that, what is that with religion and solar cooking? And then I realized that actually solar cooking goes quite along with the principles of Hinduism. So I talked to my project leader about that, and I said to him, you know, I think there is some religion, and I'm, uh, there is some relation, and I think I'm going to write a paper on the role of spiritual commitment on the use of solar cookers. And he looked at me and said, did you go completely mad now? Hinduism, solar cooking? And I said, yes, there is something. So I started reading a book about Hinduism, and I mean, whoever thought, I, I never expected that I would read books about Hinduism when working with solar cooking. The thing is, I want to explain to you, uh, in Hinduism, one very important concept is purity. And purity is also related to cooking. It depends on what kind of ingredients you use for preparing food and also um, the, uh, the type of uh, the, the way you prepare your food. And by using a solar cooker, which is a clean energy technology, because you're not using firewood anymore, you do not produce smoke, you, clean, uh, you cook in a cleaner way, in a purer way. But there is even more than that. As some of those religious institutions, uh, organizations I visited, they said to me that, you know, for us it is very important that um, the stage of mind while cooking. It's very important to think positive while you're cooking because they think that when you think positive, that will be transferred to the food and then it will be taken on by the person who's eating the food. So what I was thinking is, by using a solar cooker and having this clean aspect, it enhances the positive thinking, and then it has a positive outcome as well. Another thing is that in Hinduism, life is regarded as sacred. 
This means you do not want to eat food which is based on the life of others. So if you can explain people that by using firewood, you actually destroy a lot of microorganism in the tree and lives in the tree, that's not good, and you do not want to eat that, what's there. So I realized that actually we can use religion for solar cooking, but it's not only about religion, what I want to say. It's about all these kind of human aspects we need to consider. We need to consider in the societies which can either enable or limit the use of solar cookers. But there is more than this. I have another story, and that's the other fact is the problem with solar cookers, and that's maybe the biggest problem, is that solar cookers are just not cool. They're really not cool. Um, when I went for my fieldwork to South Africa, I talked there to a man who is producing a small solar box cooker. And I asked him, and I said to him, so, you're building those solar cookers. Anyone who's buying that, and who's buying that? And he said to me, you know, it's actually very tricky, because we have that problem that the white population of South Africa comes to our store and they say, wow, that's a great solution for the black people. While the black people come to their store and say, no, 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 we know the white people are not using it. Why should we use it? Are we second choice again? So you see, there are these kind of um, image problems with solar cookers. Solar cookers are normally designed for the poor. But who wants to be considered as poor? No one wants to be considered as poor. Poor people want to have the same standard as the rich people. Um, and that's a big problem. So what all these examples have in common is actually that they all have this, that we normally design technologies for others, and that's a big problem. Engineers are sitting in their laboratories developing the best kind of technical solution, but they do not consider their end user needs or this kind of uh, human aspects underlying this. And we have to consider this. We are producing technologies for people with different lifestyles where we have no idea about it. And of course, it cannot succeed. But I don't want to be too pessimistic here. So there are also some other things uh, to think about. And um, I want to give you one example how it can be in another way. Um, that's a person uh, I know quite working on solar cookers all around the world. Her partner developed one of the biggest solar cookers. And they use solar cookers themselves at home. So this means they are working with solar cookers in developing countries, and they are using them at home in Germany. So there is actually the option of changing that image, of using those technologies. And by using those technologies yourself, you first of all understand better what are the problems with the technology, and you do something for this image issue. But um, I have another picture here, I think. Yeah, here you can see. So I visited those people, and we were cooking solar. We were baking bread with a solar cooker, and... You can see it works really well, and it's great because you just use the sun, and the sun is for free. You do not have to buy any fuel, and it's renewable. So, but this image issue I'm talking about is not only related to solar cooking, I realized. Uh, during my field work in Burkina Faso, I had a research assistant, and I had hired a local driver. And almost every day, we drove to some villages to conduct some interviews. One day in the car, I said to him, you know, it's really tiring for me to sit so much in a car. I'm not used to it. And he looked at me and he said, why? But you live in Norway. You should have a car. No, I don't have a car. But how do you get from one place to another? I have a bicycle and I have a bus card. A bus card? You are taking the bus? Yes, I'm taking the bus. And I realized, oh my God, there is really this image issue. People think that, okay, because I'm from the Western world, I must have a car. And by saying that I don't have a car, I realized I could change the mindset of that person. And maybe in the evening he would go to others and tell them, you know, I know that crazy girl living in Norway, she doesn't have a car. Those kind of things. So I realized, wow, I can have really an impact by changing like that. So before, I, I mean, I, I didn't have a car mainly because of the economics, because it's expensive. But since this experience, I realized, no, it actually has a much higher impact by not having a car. So I try to adapt to this and have some more personal changes in my life. And one thing is actually that I'm trying not to eat too much meat, and I really like meat, and I think I will probably never be a vegetarian. But 
I know it's not good for the environment. I know it's not good for my health. So sometimes I'm in the supermarket and I'm standing in front of the shelf and I see that chicken and then I think, hmm, I really would like to eat some chicken today. No, it's not good. Then I think, but I can buy the ecological chicken, then it's better. And then I try to justify in front of myself and I start thinking, but you had a really tough week and you don't have a car. Maybe I can buy the chicken. <laughs> so... <laughs> There is this kind of personal conflict with myself, and um, that's not only related to myself, but that's also related to solar cooking. And that's what we have. We have certain beliefs in our life. We know that, okay, it's not good for the environment to have a car. It's not good to, have, to eat meat. But then we act in a different way. And that's the same with solar cooking. And while I was thinking, um, I remembered a very important quotation, and you probably think, oh, no, that's the cliche quotation now. But... It's from Ahmad Gandhi saying, be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's exactly the point I want to make. Because we need to change ourselves in order to change others. And more important, we have to look at this gap we normally have between um, the beliefs we have and the, the acting we do. And we want maybe people to use solar cookers, but then there are other issues that maybe the neighbors think it's not cool and therefore people are not using it, even though they know all those benefits. So... You remember in the beginning of that talk, I told you that um, I was quite shocked about the community toilet and that I wanted to change something after that. And I always thought changing something means going to other places and helping people. But I realized actually during my fieldwork that changing means looking into my own backyard for first and change something there. So if you are someone who wants to change, to create change in other communities, or you're just struggling with improving your own life. Think about those human aspects I just told you about. Spend some time to investigate them. And even more important, remember that causing change means also changing yourself. Thank you. <laughs>